My name is Taryn Trott. I work in the emergency department and the medical ICU at the University of Kentucky. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about ventilation in cardiac arrest. Now, I think we can probably all agree that all the glamor and all the glitz really gets put on early defibrillation and high quality chest compressions. But how do we consider, how do we work in ventilation in our cardiac arrest patients? To kind of tackle this topic, we're gonna look at one, we'll start with the guidelines. We're going to go over some of the pathophysiology because honestly, it gets pretty complex. And if we're going to make educated decisions, we really have to have a good understanding. And then, of course, we're going to go and see if we can do better than we're already doing. So let's start with the 2020 AHA guidelines on ventilation. Now, these were most recently updated in 2020, but they had most or previously been updated in 2015. And honestly, we didn't see that much of a delta between the two versions as it relates to um, ventilation. So there's three main components that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna focus on. And that's one, that without an R airway, the guidelines recommend that we do either a 30 to two compression to ventilation um, or breaths or 10 continuous breaths with, without an airway established during chest compressions. Now, alternatively, with an airway, we say that, or the AHA guidelines recommend 10 breaths a minute continuous with compressions. Now, how much tidal volume? The guidelines say 600 ml tidal volume or enough to see the chest rise. And I always find that a little bit amusing because how are you supposed to see the chest rise during compressions? Yeah, I guess maybe during that 10 seconds, you might be able to estimate what that appropriate tidal volume is. So what's the concept behind this? Because intuitively, when I thought about this, I always thought, wow, 10 breaths per minute is awfully low for a patient who's so sick they're in cardiac arrest. And the balance to that was that in a state of cardiac arrest and state of chest compressions, you may be generating 10 to 15% of the optimal cardiac output. And if you're only generating 10 to 15% of the cardiac output, that means very little CO2 is being delivered to the lungs. Now, in that case, low CO2 to the lungs would also imply that you don't need very high ventilation requirements. But how much of this is validated or is this just a principal idea? So what is the evidence? Well, not surprisingly, the evidence for ventilation per the AHA guidelines come from 10 pig studies and one observational human study from like a million years ago. And so it was from these studies that a respiratory rate of 10 was determined to not be worse than any other respiratory rate. So all these looked at different respiratory rates and basically they found no difference. Of course, this was low quality evidence in pigs and simulated cardiac arrest. So not really strong evidence and I can't be more clear on that. And when I think about this and I think about my patients, you know, I think about maybe in the ICU, I have a critically ill patient. They're on the ventilator. Their pH is 701. They have a PCO2 of 18 and a bicarb of 5. So they're in some extreme version of severe metabolic acidosis. And because of this, I'm using the ventilator to blow off as much of that CO2 as possible. So I have them on the vent at a respiratory rate of 36. Nonetheless, the patient goes into cardiac arrest. So I have the patient severe metabolic acidosis compensated with the ventilator best I can, still extremely sick. And the next thing I'm supposed to do per AHA guidelines is place the patient on a respiratory rate of 10. Now, to me, that sounds a little crazy. Now, okay, you don't work in the ICU, you work in the emergency department. Let's take our out of hospital cardiac arrest patient who shows up. Now, maybe you have access to point of care labs, you get a gas. This demonstrates pretty extreme respiratory acidosis. Your PCO2 is undetectably high, but your bicarb is normal. You know this patient is not eliminating CO2 at all. And again, in cardiac arrest, is a respiratory rate of 10 really the best idea? So let's pause there and let's dive into our physiology of what's going on. And this is a lot of heart-lung interactions, of course, uh, probably the main reason I went into critical care. And let's not forget our goal. Our goal during CPR resuscitation is coronary and cerebral perfusion pressure and maintaining ox oxygen delivery via those methods. Let's talk first about chest compressions. Now, it's pretty intuitive that we, the main concept of chest compressions is to directly compress the ventricle, expel blood. But there's actually a lot more dynamics at play. We have intrathoracic pressure changes with each compression. And one, this can affect the blood. 
So we have in increased intrathoracic pressure that's going to impede blood flow returning and also assist with blood flow ex expelling from the heart. Now, also importantly, increases in thoracic pressure or due to chest compressions cause changes in ventilation. So let me say that again, when you compress the chest, you're increasing intrathoracic pressure and you're actually causing exhalation. Now, alternatively, when you release your chest compression, the elastic recoil of the chest actually causes air to be drawn back into the lungs. So we actually see that there's three main concepts at play. You know, ultimately at one point, chest compression only ventilation, i.e. using that thoracic pump to deliver tidal volume was investigated. We actually saw two or three studies measuring the amount of tidal volume during chest compression only ventilation and we saw that ultimately it really wasn't alone or good enough alone uh, by producing pretty much inadequate volumes of maybe 50 to 150 mls per chest compression so let's move on to ventilation so we know that the chest compression can augment ventilation but of course what does ventilation it suit itself do and of course our goal is ox adequate oxygenation and then ventilation or minute ventilation by means of removal or management of co2 and often we think of ventilation just in terms of co2 but obviously we need some air movement to provide oxygenation now in the first scenario hypoventilation we're actually going to lead to an increase in co2 and what are all the downfalls of that well ultimately quite a bit Hypoventilation can lead to an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, decrease in systemic vascular resistance, and actually make it harder to defibrillate our patients. This, this hypoventilation increased in CO2 and subsequent acidosis leads to atelectasis and further shunting, which can make multiple of these factors even worse. Alternatively, not just hypoventilation, we see hyperventilation or a decrease in CO2. And this leads to things like cerebral vasoconstriction, an increase in intrathoracic pressure, things like gastric insufflation. So we know that there's going to be a balance. We have to consider what does our patient need and how we're managing ventilation to address all of these different variables. Now that's ventilation management of oxygenation, hyperventilation, hypoventilation, but what about the effect of positive pressure as, as viewed in isolation? So we know that positive pressure in decreases venous return and subsequently decreases cardiac output and this again leads to decreased coronary and cerebral blood flow again what we said are our two most important factors now factors that affect this or can be the ventilatory rate but it can also be things like decreased expiratory time leading to things like breath stacking and auto peeping and of course speaking of peep seen as another independent variable we'd see that yeah, we like PEEP in our intubated patients, but we also know there's a kind of a sweet spot, meaning when we take our PEEP and we go too far with it, we actually see a lot of deleterious effects. One, we see increased pulmonary vascular resistance, which can adversely affect the right heart, and again, leading to less effective chest compressions and decreased cardiac output. So that was kind of a blast of a lot of different concepts, which I think honestly, you'd probably have to really dive into to really feel like strong ownership of them. But what I'm trying to imply is that there's a big balance going on between how you're ventilating, how you're adding positive pressure, what your patient's PEEP is, and of course, always keeping in mind what the patient's etiology is. <clears throat> so what we see is that the AHA guidelines have pretty limited data and recommendations, maybe because it's a fairly complex and heterogeneous group of variables that we can't just nail to every single patient in cardiac arrest. So let's go back to our patient that I mentioned that was in a severe respiratory acidosis. Now in this example, I'm not saying I know the exact answer, but I'm going to provide as an example that maybe I think perhaps this patient's respiratory rate should go up to 20 because I have this gas demonstrating a severely elevated PCO2. At the same time, I've decided that I'm worried about increasing my intrathoracic pressure, so I keep my tidal volume at a minimum. Now the EMS also reported that the patient before arresting maybe was having a COPD exacerbation. So at that point I'm instructing RT, well let's also increase our expiratory time to make sure we're not auto stacking. Now these are just examples, right? But it's me kind of addressing and titrating my ventilatory status in arrest to the patient in front of me rather than 
just using a one size fit all respiratory rate of 10. And of course, I'm weighing all of these things together to try and do the best thing for my patient. And I bring this all up because I want you to feel enabled. There is this variable that is inevitably very significant. And the one size fit all is first not based on significant evidence, but it can also be tailored to the patient in front of you. So what usually happens? Well, usually what we have is a patient being bagged via endotracheal tube, LMA, or BVM, right? They're being bagged, but I also think we can kind of titrate this a lot more as well. Now, the glamour again has been going to, or most recently in, in, in the FOMED world or in recent publications, is our volume. But I think we actually have a lot of missed opportunities for how we're bagging. So volume, of course, has been recently studied, but we also see that we can control the respiratory rate. We control the inspiratory and expiratory time and positive expiratory pressure via PEEP valve. And we can also kind of determine lung compliance. How hard is it to bag? And so we get all this information from the BVM itself, but we can also kind of tailor, take this yet another step further. And that's where we're going to say, enter in mechanical ventilation. And so you can do all this on the back. And I encourage you to start thinking about these variables, but why not do it in a more precise manner? So data shows that when we try and target a respiratory rate or we try and target a tidal volume, we're inevitably not very good at it. And I think our mainstream foam has done a good job at kind of highlighting that, but our studies still show that we're all over the place in how we actually deliver this. Mechanical ventilation, first and foremost, is that we can make specific settings. I've decided for this patient, I want a respiratory rate of 20. I've got that respiratory rate and it's not changing until I change my clinical decision making. We also get these pleiotropic effects of reducing the amount of personnel. If it was your RT that was doing the bagging, you've now freed RT to do whatever else we need to do to assist in this resuscitation. Cognitive offloading. I don't want to worry that I'm not getting the right variable set on this patient by BVM. Instead, I've got it exactly where I want on the ventilator. So how do we do this? How do we switch to mechanical ventilation? Honestly, it's not that complicated. One, I want you to make sure that your patient is easy to bag, right? If you're having a hard time bagging, do not put that person on the ventilator. In fact, maybe investigate why you're having a hard time and maybe pop that chest tube in or something along those lines. In this case, you will need an endotracheal tube or a laryngeal mask airway. At that point, we're just connecting to the vent. I'm usually using volume control. I set the PEEP to five, pretty much a standard value and then i'm setting the volume and rate as decided and of course i can get into it i can set whatever variables i want per the ventilator and get them in a re reproducible way now really important is that we need to disable the pressure limit or the pressure alarm what we don't need is the chest compressions stopping the delivery of a breath so if you can disable it altogether, that's the way to go now, again, I want you to feel enabled. You're evaluating your patient, you're seeing what variables need to be adjusted, and now you're able to make those in a finite and discrete way. At that point, you've successfully resuscitated your patient. At that point, you can just titrate your vent to the next blood gas or however else you feel fit. All right, that's a rapid summary of ventilation and cardiac arrest. Again, my name is Taryn Trott. Thank you very much.